We are in the midst of a series that I have felt needed, that I have felt was necessary in the Christian family and in the world to bring. And I believe that right now perhaps uh, pastors all over the country are preaching similar themes, uh, and that is about the Jew. It's been many, many years since I brought a long series, uh, that is more than one or two messages at a time, concerning the things of Israel, the things of the Jews. And I wanted to bring this because I believe it's necessary and important, and so I'm answering some questions today. You know, the, the, it's been said, and I've said it myself, that God doesn't answer the why questions. But, you know, that's not really true. Sometimes He does answer the why questions. It is rare. Mostly God doesn't answer the why questions, but sometimes He does. But now here's, here's the thing about that. Uh, the answer He gives may be different than what we were looking for. God sometimes does answer the why questions. And He answers this one. Let's look at our text, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. We're asking, why the Jews? Why Israel? And in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 through 9, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For you, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh the king? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The question could be asked, why did you love Israel? And if we could just summarize the answer, I would say that God's answer would be this, because. Now that's how sometimes when we don't either want to give an answer, or maybe we don't have a ready answer, somebody asks you, why did you do this? Oh, because. Why did you love them? Well, because I loved you. Why did you choose them? Because I chose them. He answers, but the answer is wrapped up in the sovereign mind of God himself. He did not choose Abraham because Abraham was perfect. He didn't work with Isaac because Isaac was perfect. He wasn't. He didn't work with Jacob because Jacob was perfect. He certainly was not. He didn't work with the 12 tribes of Israel because each of the heads of those 12 tribes were perfect. No, they were not. He didn't work with David because David was perfect. David was not perfect. He worked with them because he chose to work with them. And he loved them because he chose to love them. But there are other why questions. There are other things that people are interested in about the Jews that I think it's wise and good for us to answer. And so let's first of all, the first question, why did God choose Israel? And it's basically the answer that we get is because I loved him. And he was going to keep his covenant. He made a promise to Abraham and he intends to keep it. He said, I loved you because I loved you. I chose you because I chose you. Now in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, we have something that's similarly written to us. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So the scriptures make it plain that God's love to us as Christians starts with him. It doesn't start with us. He loves us first, and then we love him. And so the scriptures show that God did and choose Israel. Now let's understand this is a biblical fact. I'm going to read several passages. I'm going to read them rapidly. So if you're into writing them down, write down the references I go. And don't try to turn in your Bible because you'll get lost I want you to listen, all right? Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. This is what the Bible says about the Jewish nation, about Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Isaiah chapter 14, 1. 
For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave unto the house of Jacob. This is what God promised them. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then also in Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, and they speak, God speaking of the Jews, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So God is on the record in many places and at many times understanding that he has chosen Israel. Now, there are other questions that come to mind. Through history, they have come to mind. And one of the things that people ask, because it is a question that deserves looking into, is why do the Jews tend to prosper? Now, the reason that question is asked is because they do tend to prosper. Uh, there's reams and reams of literature out there uh, dealing with this issue and no one denies that they tend to do it, except people who just deny history itself. Uh, any honest student of history and any honest student of the Jewish people uh, will have to come to the understanding that even though they're pressed down, even though they're isolated, even though they're persecuted, uh, under most circumstances, they will work until they tend to prosper. They tend to rise. They tend to, to do well. And so here's something that's interesting I found as I was researching this. And by the way, I've got more notes than usual uh, because it's a lot of facts and a lot of figures here. And I doubt that I'm going to finish this part of the sermon today. So it's probably going to be a two-parter. I'll let you know that in advance. But globally, the Jews represent less than 0.2%. Now that is two-tenths of a percent. Now that's not a lot of people compared to the rest of the people in the world. Okay, But they have made a disproportionately large amount of positive contributions to humankind. Now, the following are just only limited to those who win Nobel Prizes for their contributions to humanity. Okay, so this is put in terms. Uh, in economics, 41% of the Nobel Prizes given for economics were given to a Jew. Now, that is 205 times more than their share of the population. That's a disproportionate uh, contribution from that people group. Medicine, 28%. That's more than 140 times their share of the population. Physics, 26%. Now, notice they're only not even a percent of the people, and yet they have this high percentage of winning Nobel Prizes. Chemistry, 19%. Literature, 13%. Peace, 9%. And so we see that there is a high percentage of uh, recognized Jewish professionals who have achieved excellence in things that made your life and my life better and, and people's lives better all around the world. Now, this was done with the history of the Jews being one of being oppressed, being isolated, being marginalized, being maligned, and yet they tend to rise to this level of positive contribution. Now, uh, the contributions that Jewish people tend to make because of achieving excellence have, have sometimes uh, caused people to ask questions. Why is that? Well, there's a, there's a little bit of humor about it. And I just want to, this is a, a, a little joke, a little humor that you might find. Uh, a Jewish man is elected president. And as he's giving his first speech, his mother looks on from the crowd and she elbows a neighbor, and she says, you see that man up there? She asks uh, the man next to her, oh, you mean the president, he responds? She says, well, his brother is a doctor. <laughs> now, we laugh because there is this typical thing in the culture where Jewish families tend to push and promote and encourage achieving excellence in the professions. And uh, I had a neighbor when I lived in St. Petersburg. His name was Max. He was a short fellow, kind of round, and he, uh, he ran a filling station. He was a working class man, a uh, very devout Jewish fellow. 
And uh, he, every time we met, he wanted, he wanted to be quick to remind me that while he was blue collar and while he worked in a filling station and he had pushed his kids through college and he said, all my children are professionals. And he was proud of that fact. He had sacrificed and he had worked and he had done without himself so that his children could achieve success. Uh, this is in part uh, the reason behind this type of, of, of prosperity. Uh, they have been largely prosperous even while having the constant animosity of their neighbors. They have been disproportionately singled out for hatred through history, uh, yet an honest look at this group should cause us to ask the question, why shouldn't we be more like them? Why can't we do what they have done? Why can't we uh, seem to achieve the type of success proportionally that they do? Uh, everywhere the Jews have gone, education, wellness, art, literature, science, and entertainment has thrived. It is fair to say that per capita, the Jewish people have been a greater blessing to the world than any other uh, people group or ethnicity by comparison. Now, by the way, the second highest numbers of Nobel Prize winners uh, were Christians. But that shouldn't be surprising since their numbers are far greater and the influence of the Judeo-Christian ethic has spilled over onto them. And so Christians benefit from their relationship to the Jewish scriptures and the morality and the family life and structure that they have. Now, I want to read something that I don't normally read excerpts of what other people have written, but this was such a good article that I wanted to bring it out. And it's one of those articles that I thought was one of the better uh, written ones. Why do Jews succeed is the question. And it's written by a man named Jerry Z. Muller. And I just want to read a few excerpts from this, uh, talking about why they tend to prosper. But it says, By and large, economists and other social scientists have neglected the history of the Jews and capitalism for reasons that are understandable, though unconvincing. For most economists, the extent to which modern capitalism has been shaped by earlier cultural predispositions is a source of puzzlement at best, if not merely a factor to be dismissed. Now, what he's saying, if you read between the lines, is part of the reason that we don't recognize why the Jews prosper as we should recognize it is because some have a tendency to not give credit to the system of capitalism as they have because the Jews have long since Moses and before practiced capitalism. They believe in ownership, ownership of land, ownership of business. They believe in industry. They believe uh, in families being in control of their own wealth. Now he says, a look at the historical experience of the Jews shows that while most Jews were mired in poverty at the beginning of the 20th century, over time they tended to, disproportion to do disproportionately well in societies that allowed them to compete on an equal basis. That was the case first in Central and Western Europe and then in the United States. And they did particularly well in commerce and things of that nature. He goes on to say this, for one thing, the Jews had more experience with commerce than most other groups, and the tacit knowledge of buying, selling, and calculating advantage that was passed on in families with ties to business helps explain why the Jews tended to be better at it. Uh, in other words, because they had traveled and yet kept in touch with the places they had traveled from, which had kept in touch with the places they had traveled from, they had a network of commerce that they created uh, mainly from their travels. So they learned to be on the lookout for new opportunities in undeserved markets, working as peddlers, for example, or creating new products or new forms of marketing. In other words, they had to be innovative. All right. Another excerpt, he says, much of success in a capitalist society is based on cultural and historical factors that produce qualities such as innovativeness, willingness to tolerate risk, and willingness to defer gratification through savings and education. But cultures that tend to resent the economically successful, either as an affront to equality or on the implicit assumption that the economic gains of some must be at the expense of others, tend to be more hostile toward Jews and given to conspiratorial theories that explain their economic success. In other words, they say they only got rich because they cheat or they got rich because they stole it from someone else. Most societies lie somewhere along the spectrum between these two poles. Some social scientists are wary of calling attention to the reality of disproportionate Jewish economic success for fear of arousing anti-Semitism. 
But the fact that the history of Jews and capitalism calls current socioeconomic wisdom and method into question is more, more than uh, reason to explore the topic. So what he's saying, to be fair, uh, is that when we examine the Jewish people, why do they prosper? There are certain answers that come out. And then we ought to give that a fair look and say, well, if that works for them, then why shouldn't we recognize that that's something that works? And maybe other people can do that as well. And we see through history, even in biblical history and modern history, that this is indeed the case. Uh, people should be looking and trying to emulate rather than to uh, resent it. Now we're going to go to another question. And I think that this ties in with what we just read because Jews uh, as a people do tend to prosper. The next question that is often asked is, why have the Jews in Israel been so hated? Now that's another question that you can't deny the validity of because they have. More than any other people group in the history of the planet, the Jews have been hated. They have been maligned. They have been mistreated. They have been persecuted. And several times there were attempts to annihilate them altogether. You can't find another people group in the history of the planet that has received as much hatred and abuse as have the Jewish people. And so we understand that this is a question that, uh, that, that we ought to look at and, and, and see that it, it's a real question. Now, first of all, let's just make a point. They have been hated. Now, we're going to look at some instances, and I think history bears it to be true, and, and uh, we can't really uh, deny it. First of all, pagans have hated the Jews. Pagans hated the Jews, uh, their neighbors who were idol worshipers. Uh, they hated the Jews because of their worship of the one true God, and they're claiming that uh, the other gods are false gods. They were hated for that. And in Roman times and in Greek times, uh, the Jews were hated because uh, of their attitude about their God being the only true God. It irked the neighbors uh, that they said this. And so they hated the Jews and persecuted them at times. Now, what may be a bit of a surprise to some, but not if you've studied church history, is that uh, not only have pagans hated the Jews, but some Christian groups have hated the Jews. It's a sad commentary on certain groups of so-called Christians and Christianity and denominations that they believed and practiced uh, forms of anti-Semitism. Well, let's just go down uh, the facts, okay? The Catholics... The Catholic Church, in the years before the Holocaust, the Catholic Church repeatedly tried to spread the alarm against the rapacious Jewish people bent on reducing all Christians to their slaves. Catholics were warned to beware of their Jewish neighbors, deemed to be members of a secret world conspiracy. This was the kind of language that was often heard. Now, during the Middle Ages, going further back, the Catholic Church institutionalized anti-Semitism through the creation of discriminatory laws and the establishment of the Inquisition. This led to widespread persecution of Jews, including forced conversions, expulsions, and pogroms. Jews were expelled from Catholic kingdoms, including England and Spain, and many of the principalities and cities of the Holy Roman Empire in Italy. So the Catholic Church going back has a history of, uh, of, of uh, persecuting the Jews. Now, this may surprise you, uh, Lutherans. Luther, Martin Luther, uh, was not a fan of the Jews. Luther successfully campaigned against the Jews in Saxony, Brandenburg, and in Silesia. In August of 1536, Luther's prince elector of Saxony, John Frederick, issued a mandate that prohibited Jews from inhabiting, engaging in business, or passing through his realm. Josel of Roshim, who tried to help the Jews of Saxony, wrote in his memoir the, that the situation was due to that priest whose name was Martin Luther. May his body and soul be bound up in hell, who wrote and issued many heretical books in which he said that whoever would help the Jews was doomed per, to perdition. I read on. Robert Michael, professor emeritus of European history at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, writes that Josel asked the city of Strasbourg to forbid the sale of Luther's anti-Jewish works. They refused initially, but relented when a Lutheran pastor in Holzfelden argued in a sermon that his parishioners should murder Jews. 
Now, how would you like to show up to church to worship God and hear your pastor instruct you that it would be a good thing and a good way to show your faith to murder Jews? I'm just reading history. Uh, let's look on. Among other similar rantings, Luther said, and this is a quote from his writings, set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or a cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see we are Christians. Now this may be a surprise to you, and we could say, well, those were unenlightened times. Those were times when they had church states and state churches. But listen, for a Christian who is in fellowship with the Lord God Almighty to have that kind of animosity toward another human being uh, is something that I, I just don't call that Christian. John Calvin, who many say was the least anti-Semitic of the reformers. In other words, he was the least uh, that was a hater of the Jews. He said this, their rotten and unbending stiff neckness deserves that they be oppressed unendingly and without measure or end, and that they die in their misery without the pity of anyone. Quote from John Calvin. You say, well, I'm glad England didn't get into that. Well, the Anglicans. The Anglicans. A special service held at Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford was attended by Britain's chief rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, and the representatives of Archbishop Canterbury, Justin Welby, to mark the Synod of Oxford passed in 1222. The Synod, now this is a reference to the Synod, the Synod forbade social interaction between Jews and Christians, placed a specific tithe on the Jews, and required them to wear an identifying badge. Now this was in England. They were also banned from some professions and from building new synagogues. The decrees were followed by more anti-Jewish laws and eventually the mass expulsion of England's 3,000 Jews uh, of, the, of the time of 1290. It would be another 360 years before the Jews were permitted to return. So Mario England has a history with the Anglican Church of anti-Semitism hating the Jews. Now other groups were more friendly. Quakers, Baptists, uh, Mennonites, uh, Congregationalists, others uh, were not anti-Semitic in this sense. Uh, they were uh, more friendly, uh, though they uh, wanted the Jews to receive Christ, and they may disagree with them theologically. They uh, looked at them as neighbors to whom they should show love, and to, to say, I love my neighbor as I love myself. Uh, this, is, uh, part of their, this was due to their interpretation of Scripture, which recognizes the Abrahamic covenant, and also their shared view of the separation of church and state, that we are not here as a church to force our religion upon other people, so we live and let live. And so Baptists have had a history of that. Now it's a matter of record that Muslims have hated the Jews. Now this is, goes without saying, but it goes way back to Muhammad and his attempts to convert and conquer the Jews to bring them into Islam and under the rule of Islam. Muhammad practiced the same animosity toward Christians and for the same reasons. But the Jews lived in and claimed empire in their claimed empire and refused assimilation. Now, we're trying to answer the question, why do people hate the Jews? And it's not a hard question. In fact, it's a one-word answer, if we can bring that up. And the answer is envy. It's a one-word answer, and it's not hard. It's not rocket science. When some people, no matter what you do to them, tend to prosper... Other people can get envious. Listen, do you know that it was envy that caused Cain to kill his brother Abel? Because his sacrifice was accepted to God and Cain's sacrifice was not. And God even gave Cain an opportunity to make it right. And instead of making it right, he went and killed his brother. I'll give you another example. We won't turn to the passage because it's long and covers several chapters. But Isaac, who was the inheritor of the covenant from Abraham, was wandering through the land, and he settled in a place close to Gaza, and so he was planting crops, and he'd found a well. It was an old well, so he dug it out, and he had water to come out, and he used that water to plant crops, and it had a great increase, and he, he was prospering from his work uh, farming that land, which had been neglected, which had not been watered, which had not been irrigated. In other words, he, from his own labor, did something that prospered him and gave him the ability to trade with his neighbors. Well, what did his neighbors do? 
they went and stopped the well full of dirt. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, but there's one thing you've got to know about Israel. It's never, ever, ever a bad thing to have more water. More water is good. He didn't take their water. He didn't divert a stream that used to serve them, and he dug a well where they had not dug one. He got water that was being wasted and wasn't doing anybody any good, and through his own industry and own effort was prospering because of the water. So what does he do? He moves a little further away, and he digs another well, finds water there, and begins work again. They come and run him off from that well also, and so he finally goes another place, far enough away for them to leave him alone, and he does now, now, I said all that to say this. When is it ever bad to have more water? When is it ever bad to have more food? Uh, if he made enough food to feed everybody, that would be a good thing. You could trade, you could buy it. The more food you have, the cheaper it gets. Listen, if I was going to pay, uh, you know, a dollar uh, for a, a banana or a dime for a banana, uh, I'd like to pay a dime. Well, that's the kind of thing that was going on in that uh, world. So it was envy. And there's, there's really no other answer for it but that. Now, another question we could ask. And it's a fair question. Why don't the Jews accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? I've been asked that question. And sometimes it takes uh, this form. Uh, do the Jews believe like we do? Or why do they believe different than we do? Or are the Jews going to go to heaven or are they going to go to hell? Listen, when God places his word, when I have a question... And, and, and I don't understand all the answers. I go to the Word of God. And the Word of God answers this question. Again, it's a why question. And it's something that uh, I'm looking for a different answer. But this is the answer we get. And I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. By the way, when we ask that question, let's understand. Many thousands of Jews have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are devout Christians. They are still Jewish. They still enjoy the culture. They still even celebrate the holidays, but they believe in Yeshua HaMessiah as their Lord and Savior, and they are just like you and me in their faith. But the nation as a nation and the people group as a people group largely are not uh, believers as we see it. But in Romans chapter 11, verse 27 through uh, verse 25 through 27, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, if we would ask, why haven't the Jews accepted Christ? The Bible says, well, they, they've been blinded. As a nation, as a people group, they've been blinded. But the Bible says one day their blindfold is going to come off. One day they're going to be brought in. And the nation of Israel will be a Christian nation. They will love the Lord Jesus Christ and accept their Messiah. Do you realize that the, the Christian Messiah is the Jewish Messiah? We are grafted in. We're a wild olive branch. We didn't belong. We were Gentiles. We were outside the covenant without God in the world. But when Jesus came and died on the cross, the veil was rent in twain, and the door that separated us was thrown wide open, and Gentiles can come to God through Jesus Christ, and we can sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we are inheritors with Christ and with all those who have followed God all the way back to righteous Abel, who was slain as the first martyr. We have here to understand that, yes, the Jews as a nation have not accepted Christ, but many have, and many more will. Romans chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. Let's, let's look at that. Romans 11 and verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. 
So God has allowed them to dwell in a state of unbelief. And they're going to do that until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And that's the times we're in now. So listen, what the Bible is saying, and it says it all over the place in many different places, God's not finished with the Jews. He's still working with the world through the Jews. Right now, the church is a parenthetical age. It's a parenthetical dispensation. God worked with the Jews before the church. God works with the world through the church now uh, as, as something that is an extension of Judaism. But there will be a time when God will deal with the world again through Israel. And so that is coming in the future. Number five, why are the Jews important to Christians? Why should we think about them? Why should we study them? Uh, why should it be a concern of ours about the nation of Israel? Uh, why is that important to Christians? This is something that is a fair question to ask, and I hope that I can answer it uh, in this uh, next point. We know about the creation of the earth from Moses, an Israelite from the tribe of Levi, from his inspired pen. We also know about the fall of mankind and the promise of a Savior, the great flood, the patriarchs, the Exodus, and the Ten Commandments. Uh, I want us to understand something today, that it is important that we understand, the, because the Scriptures, the Scriptures came from the Jews, and we have them from, from them also, it is from the God-breathed pen of Isaiah, a Jew, that we learn of him who was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. It was from the Jewish prophet Daniel that we learn of successive world powers and the coming of the great stone that fills the whole earth. It is from the Jewish prophets that we learn of the coming of the forerunner uh, who would come in the power and spirit of Elijah to make a way for the coming of the Lord. The Jews told us of the birthplace of Christ, His lineage, the attempt upon His life, that He came out of Egypt, that He would be called a Nazarene, and that He would die, but He would also live again. There is no other collection of books or so-called sacred writings in the world that can begin to match the Holy Bible. Only the Bible tells us how we began, why we are here, and where it is all going. Only the Scriptures give us by God's, uh, were given to us by God's people, the Jews, has prophecies that accurately and with fine-tuning predict future events many times hundreds of years in advance with absolute perfect accuracy. This is a miraculous book that was given to us because God said, I'm going to use the Jews. And they have the ones that given us the Scriptures. The Old Testament and the New Testament was largely written by Jewish people. So not only have the Jews been a blessing in providing the Scriptures to the entire world, but their culture and devotion to national identity has been a historically amazing testament to the promise of God to bless them that bless Israel and curse them that curse Israel. No nation that perpetrated evil against Israel prospered long. History will show that the nations who attacked God's people, the Jews, met, met terrible defeat and eventual collapse. You can look through and you can see, oh, listen, you think about Haman. Haman hated the Jews. He hated Mordecai. He wasn't just interested in killing Mordecai. He wanted to kill all of Mordecai's family. He wasn't just interested in killing all of Mordecai's family. He wanted to kill every Jew everywhere, period. And he even got the king to be his special friend and to sign an edict to have them all wiped out. He said, we don't need those people. They're bad. But here's what he didn't know. Here's what the king and, and uh, that, that was Esther, that, that woman who, who said she's come to the kingdom for such a time as this. She went and interceded at the threat of her own life, and God worked a great miracle. And so what happened? You see, Haman had built a, a scaffold to put Mordecai on. I think it was 70 feet tall, something like that, tall. He wanted to hang him high. He had this scaffold built. Well, listen, when all this went down and the king realized he'd been duped and the king realized how valuable the Jews really were, he had Haman hung on that very scaffold that he'd built for the Jews. Listen, you just don't want to poke your finger in the apple of God's eye. And we see nations through history, uh, Rome and, and Babylon and others, who God may have allowed even to bring judgment upon Israel, but then God judged the, those that judged him because of the evilness of their heart. Listen, it's a good idea just to stay away from doing harm to Israel. We understand today that there are certain things that come about because of prosperity and the things that you choose to do 
and the reason that, uh, that people prosper. And I want to deal just a little bit before I close, before we bring it to a, a close. It looks like we, we may yet, uh, you know, close the entire uh, message. But, you know, if something works for one group of people, it can work for another group of people. We're all people. And it's racist to say otherwise. It's racist to think otherwise. You know, one of the reasons why uh, Jews tend to do well, I think it's in the lesson somewhere. Is it in, there, uh, in the notes, Jeff? Is there a, a line there about different things they have? Is, uh, well, if he doesn't find it, that's fine. I, I can bring it out from memory. But basically, uh, it's this. Okay, here we have it. Strong family and community support. Listen, if any group of people have a strong family and have community support, you're going to do better than if you don't. And one of the things, and here it is, is a mother and a father in the same home. Now you can say whatever you want about the Jews. You can say whatever you want. You can criticize all you want. But what you cannot say isn't true, that they, ha they have strong families. They have Ma, they have Pa, and they have the kids. And they stick together. And uh, that may be a criticism for some, but it is a great source of strength. Strong family and cultural support. Education. Early on, the Jews learned to read the Torah. They learned to read the scriptures. They learned to read uh, different languages, and they are given to education. It's a high value. It's very important to them. Any people group that, that, that values education is going to prosper. Then you have engaging in trade. Listen, if you're busy, if you're busy, if you're trading, if you're trying to find ways to make a buck, you'll find ways to make a buck. And it doesn't matter who you are. Practicing innovation. Uh, listen, if, if all you do is one thing and that's all you do and all you want to do and all you ever plan to do, you're going to be limited to that one thing. But if you innovate and you ask yourself, what more can I do? What other can I do? That's the ticket to success. You've got to find something that is the next thing. And, and the Jewish community tends to do that. Okay, a wise use of capital. Let me tell you what that means. If, if, if the average person gets a hundred dollars, oh, I've got a hundred dollars. Look here, a hundred dollars. Most of the time they think of something fun to do with it. That tends to be what I do. I think, hey, I've got an extra hundred dollars. Listen, uh, prosperous people don't think of an extra hundred dollars. You know what they say? I'll start a fund for my second grandchild's college education. That's what people groups that prosper do. Whenever they get a windfall, whenever they get prosperous, whenever they get success, instead of buying a bigger, better color TV, they find a way to put it back into their business, hire a new employee, uh, get a nephew employed, uh, find a, a way to, to get some uh, uh, niece they have married well so that she can start her own family. They do that kind of thing. So they use their capital wisely. And then last but not least, deferment of gratification. In other words, don't live for the moment, live for the future. Have a long plan and stick to it. I submit to you that A through F will help any people group on the planet if they do it. It'll help Irish immigrants like my ancestors. It'll help German immigrants, uh, people from Finland, or you name the country, you name the area, Africans, South Americans, Australians, uh, Chinese, Russians. I don't care who you are and where you came from or whatever happened in the past. If you practice those kind of things, you're going to tend to prosper. So why are the Jews important? Why should we want to know about them? Why should we befriend them? Why should we protect them and keep them from being wiped out? Well, the reason is, is they're good for the world. They're good for you. They're good for me. The lessons they have come, listen, from our Bible. <laughs> our Bible which includes the Old Testament, a Jewish book. You, you want to you wanna envy the Jews or you want to be prosperous too? Listen, I, I, if somebody does something and they work for it and they get it well to say, good for you. Now, if you don't want to do the work for that, then fine. Settle for what you already have. You, nobody's hurt you. If somebody, uh, something good happens to somebody else, listen, it's the sin of envy that makes you say anything but good for them. I'm firmly of the belief that envy is one of the great sins of the world, and we ought to avoid it with all of our hearts. Let's bring it to this. There's one more reason why we should support Israel, and here it is. 
There are many thousands of devout Christians who live there and are allowed to practice their faith in peace. That's true right now. Many thousands of devout Christians in Israel. They are citizens, they vote, they serve in the military, they can run for office, and they are living in peace in Israel. If Israel's neighbors have their way, these Christians will be persecuted and potentially wiped out of existence, as has been done in many other Islamic states. That is just the truth of it. If Hamas wins, it is not only Jews who will perish, it will be Christians and any other group that the radical jihadists hate. Oppression of women, institutionalized ignorance, terrorist training, and economic misery will be the result if the land of Israel is taken over by the jihadists. Just from purely human, decent, political reasons, Israel should win and their enemies should lose. The conclusion and application. Just as God loved and chose the Jews as His covenant people, because He simply chose to do so, God's love to you and me as believers is not due to any merit within ourselves. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John 4, 10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 5 verse 8 says this, But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know why Jesus loves you? Just because. You know why He chose you? Because He chose you. Listen, I don't understand the answer, and I don't understand why, why God even wants me in His kingdom. But I do know this. One day the Holy Spirit of God paid a visit to my heart's door, and He wooed me toward Himself, and He gave me grace to believe. And I came to Him through faith, and He washed me of my sins. He saved me. He put me on the road to heaven. He wrote my name in His book. And why does He love me? I don't know. But I know He loved me first. And I know that I love him because he first loved me. And that's all the answer I need, and it may be all the answer I ever get. And listen, if you're lost, don't envy other people. Don't be upset. Don't hate. Don't be angry. Listen, here, here's, Jesus wants to be your Savior. Jesus died for your sins. He paid your sin debt because he loves you too. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, or what your background is, or what sins you've committed, or what religion you had before. Listen, when you come to Jesus Christ, old things are passed away, all things have become new, and you can have eternal life in His name. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew, or Gentile, or black, or white, or rich, or poor, or uh, male, or female. doesn't matter what your background is. Jesus is the Savior for all men. And I look forward to the day when He comes... And listen, when he comes, he's going to come as the Jewish Messiah to rule and reign on this earth. I'm looking forward to it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Dear Father, we thank you. Even though there's many things we don't understand about it, Lord, we thank you that you called the Jews and used them as your special people on the earth to bring the Scriptures, to, to bring the Messiah uh, to be born, to die for the world. Lord, we thank you that you loved us when we were unlovable that you died for us even while we were yet sinners. We're grateful for it. And we pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.